and it's not necessarily business wise, but just in life is you got to be laser focused on your own happiness. You always got to be, you got to be looking out for number one. You got to be there and, and doing what you think is best for yourself. Um, and, and making sure that like, like Alicia said, your home is clean, then you invite people in. So you, <laughs> you always got to be laser focused on yourself because that's going to be your best self for everybody else to work with. Welcome to the Lion's Den, hosted by Lance Bachman. I'm excited to have two digital coaches for the next art group, Alicia Johnson and Nick Rowell. I hope I said that right, Nick, so I apologize. Um, welcome to the Den. Thank you for being on. And we're going to discuss a lot about digital marketing, how you guys help businesses grow the good, the bad, the ugly, and be truthful. So thanks for being on the Den, you two. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, for thanks for having us on. So Alicia, I always say beauty before bronze. Uh, <laughs> tell your story, if you don't mind, real fast and uh, who you are and what you do. Sure, sure. Well, I'm Alicia Johnston. I am, as Lance said, one of the digital marketing coaches here at Nextstar Network. Um, so a little bit about me. So I'm born and bred in uh, Minnesota. So St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, which is where Nextstar is headquartered. Um, and just a little bit about my background. So I have been in the corporate world uh, basically my entire career. So I started at Target Corporation because they're located here as well um, as an assistant uh, by Buyer, if you will. And then I went on to get my graduate degree. And with that, I made the switch into marketing um, and worked for uh, Taylor Corporation, which again, headquartered here and uh, was a marketing manager uh, for a, a party supply and costume uh, company. And then that's where I really got my digital chops in was um, in costumes. So started there and did everything costume related. I know who could have thought that, that was a job, but it was awesome and I loved it. Um, and then I moved on to uh, a Life Touch, which again, headquartered here in the digital marketing space. And then, you know, went back into costumes because it was awesome. And I ended up working uh, with the largest distributor and wholesaler in costumes in the US. And that was awesome. And from there, you know, then I, I made my, I found Nextstar. So that's kind of my, um, that's kind of my journey. But, you know, I really, from the digital side of things, um, my forte, and you'll hear Nick and I, we have our different fortes, but mine is um, in the pay-per-click realm, social media, um, and affiliate marketing. So that's kind of, that's my story. Affiliate marketing. That's it. You don't hear that too much anymore these I days. I know, so, right? <laughs> so Nick, tell everybody your story, my friend. So yeah, my story, I started off, uh, again, I, like Alicia, uh, here from the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So I started working at a digital marketing agency, um, pretty much straight out of college. Uh, and got my chops there, um, worked my way up from there, learning different trades, different industries, uh, different verticals, and kind of learning my way. Uh, from there, I ended up jumping over and working over in Europe. I was the digital marketing manager for Puma.com in the European region. So I was in charge of uh, 25 different languages, 27 different countries, uh, running all the marketing that pointed towards Puma.com uh, there. Had a lot of fun doing that. It was really cool to be over there, uh, learning, working with the different business units, getting uh, to see the client side of things. And then after that, uh, uh, came back to Minnesota uh, and wanted to kind of get my family the roots here and ended up finding Nexstar, which was perfect. Uh, it's great to work with uh, the people now I get to work with great agencies like yourself, as well as amazing clients uh, in the world of HVAC and electricians and plumbing. So, Well, welcome to the den. And just for the viewers that don't know what Nextstar is, could one of you take a quick 30 seconds to a minute and explain what Nextstar is and what they do, and then we'll talk about how you affect the businesses. Yeah, I can take it, Nick. Do you want me to? Go for it. Perfect. So Nextstar Network is um, an organization um, that is dedicated to helping uh, home service companies. So as Nick said, HVAC uh, electricians and plumbers just be better businesses. So typically what we see is that, you know, you know the trade, you know the skill and you need, you know, you lack in the business sense. So we help them through coaching and training um, just again, run great and profitable businesses. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the next door models for the people out there, we refer a lot of people obviously to next door. Um, mm -hmm. They grow quite quick and quite fast because you guys seem to have the system down, uh, the processes, what you should be doing, a lot of the paperwork already. 
it seems to be a very good community where they all share with each other also. You guys yep. have an internal board where you can ask questions to other members. It's actually a pretty unique situation. Um, you know, let's talk about your jobs though as digital coaches, you know, and that's, you know, that, that, that to a lot of people that sounds like a lot, but it's really not. You're only really dealing with most likely a few core competencies for an HVAC, a plumbing and electrical company, right? So can you talk about your job as digital coaches and what you're really focused on to help these companies grow? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for our side, a lot of what we do is really trying to kind of make sure that um, these companies know what they're looking at. And like you said, there's a little bit of core competencies and it's not a, a wide breadth necessarily, but it is really about like focusing on these specific things and how frequently they change. Everybody knows that Google is constantly updating. Everything is changing in the world of digital marketing. What worked last week isn't necessarily what's going to work this week. Um, so it really is about that kind of change management and really making sure that all of our members know and are updated on like what's going on and what's going to work and, and how things work. So um, from the digital marketing side, yeah, that's that's one of our big things is just kind of keeping up on the changes and letting them know like, Hey, this is, this is still impactful. And this maybe isn't going to be as impactful as it once was. I mean, and you guys are working with all different types of personalities because let's be realistic here. I mean, uh, Heather Harlinghouse is a lot different from Brad, from radiant, from, you know, we have a lot from Larry, from school. You got like just major different personalities. Can you talk about, how you guys digest that and communicate with them. And you gotta, I'm gonna use the word pivot. I hate that word, but you gotta move, <laughs> like pivot constantly, it seems like with different parts. Can you talk about that? Is that challenging? Yeah, I think it's all about adaptability versus pivoting, right? I mean, it's just about, and actually that's in our job description um, as coaches is to be able to um, adapt to the different, um, the, the, the different skill set, right? And the different, the different um, levels of, of information and knowledge people have about digital marketing and just, you know, any, I mean, you talk to any of our coaches, you know, so, I mean, yeah, we have all different members coming in with all different levels of knowledge and, um, you know, history. Uh, so yeah, it's really being able to, you know, break it down, whatever it is, um, you know, so that they can understand uh, to, you know, to be able to make a decision. I mean, because that's the idea, right? We're not the business owners and it's still their businesses. At the end of the day, they need to be able to be informed enough to, to make a decision. So that's what we help them with. Yeah. And we deal with big personalities, not just in our uh, membership, but within our strategic partners as well. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> that <is not> me. <laughs> it definitely, it's just, it, there's lots of, everybody is a little bit different and everyone does things a little bit different. And what works for some people is going to work differently for others. And like Alicia That's said, right. we, we deal with all sorts of things, but at the end of the day, no matter what the personality is, we're always focused on improvement for the membership. How can they be better? So yes, part of our job is how do we talk with different types of people who are at different levels or different personalities, but how can we make sure ultimately that they are making steps forward and uh, progressing their business? If you like this content and you're trying to grow your business, Follow me at Lance Bachman and Lance Bachman Digital on Facebook, LFG, time to grow. You know, Nick, you said something pretty interesting. It's constantly changing, which it is. I don't think people realize how much everything changes, right? Just Facebook, the privacy updates, Google's updates. It's, just, it's always a moving target. And for different businesses based on their budget, there's different results. And ha do you feel like a lot of times when people are talking, they're, they're looking for confirmation of things are going right or wrong or what their guts tell them? Can you talk about that? Because... Tell us what you're fielding a lot of there and as digital coaches, what, what, what are you feeling? I mean, I think we are feeling a lot of that. It is a lot of people who um, a lot of times they just don't know. Again, like we, we have people, we're talking to business owners. It's not always marketing managers. A lot of times it's people who started their business and they're like, Hey, I need to know. I, I hired this company that uh, I think is good with SEO, but I don't really know like what, what is good there. And that's, that's where we step in and not necessarily just trying to explain like, yes, you're doing good or no, you're not doing good. But really, again, it's to help that growth and for help them understand like what they're looking at. So a big part of our job is to like make that balance and that transition from us just looking at their data and telling them if it's good or bad to helping them understand what that is showing them and what that means for them so that they can make those decisions for themselves. Because again, mm -hmm. we're, we're not here to 
to replace what they do. We're here to enhance them and make them as best as they can be to run their business. So it really is about kind of just breaking it down and kind of helping them understand uh, what the impact is of these things. Alicia, how do you keep up with current stuff constantly changing? What are you doing, you and Nick? I mean, talk, talk to us about that. So, I mean, what, are you reading different things? Are you talking to different people? Are you just constantly looking at the data and want to take a gun to your head like me sometimes? I mean... <laughs> All of the above <laughs> and all the above. Um, absolutely. I mean, and that is a job in itself, right? So not only are we, you know, talking to members and, you know, helping them understand their data, but, you know, we, since we are not implementing, we're not doing it anymore, right? Uh, we have gone on, you know, onto the, the coaching side. So, I mean, we're constantly reading, yep, constantly, um, you know, looking at the data and, you know, through reporting, through dashboards, you know, because, yeah, members are, um, again, depending on their business model and, you know, what they're taking on, they are, you know, some are implementing. And so we will be able to, you know, kind of get hands on training, if you will, there. And, um, you know, we go to conferences when, you know, when they start having them again, either, but we've gone to a lot of virtuals. We work with a lot of experts in the digital uh, world. Uh, we're fortunate enough to do that and do some partnerships with them. And I mean, the biggest thing that, um, you know, that keeps us updated is working with our strategic partners like you guys. I mean, just having our conversations um, monthly. I mean, I know that, you know, with some of us, we're talking weekly um, to get updates. And so we really value, and that's why, that's one of the reasons we really, really value our strategic partnerships because, um, you know, without you guys, um, we, you know, we wouldn't be privy to some of the information that, um, that you guys have shared with us. You know, Nick, you know, it seems like, when you're doing this now for a while, and I got to meet you about two years ago out in Minnesota, mm -hmm. what's some of the biggest challenges you see after two years for the small HVAC, plumbers, roofers, and even the bigger ones? What, what's some of the biggest challenges you see in the digital space for them? What's, what's some of the biggest mistakes you see and challenges, Nick? I mean, I think some of the biggest challenges they face are, again, like those changes. The fact that things are changing and that they, they, they are trying to keep up with so many different things and that they're wearing so many different hats. That's the problem is that like, they, they're not doing marketing full-time. They're not like me and you and Alicia who are really living and breathing in this world. So a lot of times it just comes down to they're trying to do too many things and they really are not necessarily giving things the focus that they need to. So a lot of times it helps for us to help narrow that down. And instead of giving this huge amount of information for them to try to absorb in field A, field B, field C, field D, they need to know everything about HR and everything about accounting and everything about marketing. It really is about trying to help them make it digestible and help them make it easy to understand so that they can do that. Because again, these a lot of these people started as Chuck in a truck and they are growing and they are learning every step of the way and they're going to learn all the way through. They're always consistently learning, but overcoming that challenge and pulling them out of getting deep into everything is, is probably the biggest challenge that I feel like we face. Alicia, I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, if we think about, you know, who, you know, Nextstar was back in the day and just the the marketing vehicles that were being used, you know, for home service companies, I mean, it was the yellow pages, right? I mean, our jobs didn't even exist 10 years ago at Nextstar. And so, um, you know, the increase of spend and the marketing budget that goes towards digital, it's, it's becoming, I mean, it's just, it's completely increased and, um, you know, from non-existent to almost, you know, 70% of budgets at some points at, you know, 100% of budgets. So, you know, really to help them, you know, help our members, um, you know, again, kind of understand you know, what they need to know to make the right decision to spend efficiently to get that return um, is, yeah, is essentially, you know, again, kind of the daily, you know, it's a lot of, it's a big part of our calls and it's a big challenge, right? Because yeah, to Nick's point, a lot of them come in, they're like, I don't know what's good, you know, and they mm -hmm. don't you know benchmarks, you know? And so, um, you know, we try to, again, help them um, understand a little bit better in terms of the benchmarks and, you know, how they can help um, a partner with their vendor and then hold them accountable as well. Yeah. I'm actually interested to hear from you, Lance, about what you think as people come into one SEO, do you see things that uh, are, are the trouble spots for them? Like what, what, what are you seeing on that side that you guys have to overcome a lot? Is it just like 
data? What like what, what are you seeing? I, I, the number one thing most people don't have set up correctly like they won't even have their service titan set up correctly so it's 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 you know if per example right so most people don't even have access to google analytics they don't even understand what's going on when they come to us um big challenge that with that right um then they don't have access they they are looking at service titan they implement service titan but they don't go back with the initial when a call comes in and put it back to where it starts so they're doing it and saying oh well what do you mean this was already existing no it started from a pay-per-click call now you, it came in direct. Well, you got to go back and hit that trigger or service telling literally just gives you a direct and it doesn't count to your. So they're making decisions off of data that's not accurate. And I know um, Nick, Alicia, a lot of people feel like I'm a big data person that maybe too much of a data person, um, which I am because numbers don't lie. People <laughs> lie about numbers, but it's hard. I, I say this to everyone. It's hard to make educated decisions without proper data. Right. Yeah. And I would say to CEOs, you know, these guys, you know, and girls are running these companies that are doing millions of years. They make sure they're P&L right. They know their margin on every piece of equipment they have for the most part. Right. But yet when it comes to their digital marketing, they don't track. They don't look at their ROI. They don't understand the system conversions. And they're like the three metrics you just, in my opinion, you need to know. And um, it blows my mind still, Nick. And I preach it all the time. Some people say I'm too passionate about it. And I, but I, you're going to make mistakes if you don't know. Um, what percentage of budget of someone's revenue, right? That's always a question we get at one SEO, right? Like the magic question, right? And I know you guys are laughing. <laughs> what do you say, Alicia and Nick, should someone put back into marketing overall? I know we can break it down digital versus traditional and have those conversations. But just if I'm a $10 million company, what percentage should I put back in? Well, I mean, what, you know, what next are in the coaches will say business coaches, your marketing coaches, us, I mean, kind of that general percentage is, you know, anywhere between the, you know, six to 8% of last year's revenue is kind of where we start as a total marketing budget. And the reason Nick and I are laughing is because the question we always get all the time is then from there, what is the percentage split between digital and, you know, your general or traditional marketing? And we all laugh at that um, because what we say is, you know, there is no, there is no magic number, um, you know, and what, you know, what we say is for those members who, you know, don't know and they're, you know, they come in or they're new, you know, we say that, you know, 70% is, is to us, if you're 70% digital, and 30%, you know, traditional or general, um, you know, it's a red flag. It may not be bad, but it's all based on your market size. It's based on your business model. It's based on, you know, this, this, and this, because obviously a new, you know, if you're just a new business, you need, you know, you're going to rely on digital more um, in some cases. And so that's okay. So it's really, you know, what we say is if it's over 70%, it's kind of a red flag. And, you know, we want you to talk to, you know, both coaches just to make sure we're in line. And again, look at the data, as you said, and let's make sure you're getting a good return. Um, and, you know, then we go from there. So, but then yeah. flip side, um, you know, again, if you're a, a solidly branded business, you are, you know, you've been it around for, you know, a, a long time, you know, maybe your digital might be a little, you know, might be the percentage may be lower because you're getting all that branded traffic and there's that brand recognition too. So. Yeah. I think that's something that um, we end up throwing around a lot with the next star mm -hmm. is the phrase, it depends. <laughs> and it's something that a lot of our members hate, but it, it, it definitely is. It's something where Everybody is in a unique scenario. And I'm mm -hmm. sure Lance, you know this, like in different regions, different company size, different goals, what like different competition, everybody's doing something a little bit differently. So it always does come down to, you know what, like that's part of what Nextar provides is that we help you answer that it depends question. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to look into it. We're going to figure out what that is. And we're going to work with you to find what you need that is going to serve your goals. What are your opportunities? What are your um, strengths that we can push towards? And maybe like even what are your weaknesses? What are like doing that SWOT analysis and figuring out what do we need to do in your specific situation to get success for you? Because it is going to change for everybody. So like, again, that's part of what Nextar provides. What would you say somebody's ROI should be? If they're spending a thousand, how much money should they make back on that? Would you say Nick or Alicia? Ballpark, just throwing it out there. It I'm depends. Sorry. It depends. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, for us, it, it all depends on the situation. I mean, I, you can generally look at a number and we could pull a number out of anywhere and say six to one. Fine. Okay. Yeah, that's good. But it really does come down to your specific situation. I have seen people be upset with eight to one return and I've seen people be happy with two to one return. It really depends on what you're trying to do. It depends on the channel. Uh, it depends on a lot of different things. So um, I have seen people spend and get a two to one return and pay-per-click and they know that they're going to get that, but they do it anyways because they have good pieces in place set up. They get lifetime value from their customers. They know they're going to keep them. So they're okay with the two to one. I've seen people with eight to one return say, you know what? I'm actually not going to do that. I, there's something else. I'm. It's peak season right now. I need to turn off that channel and go somewhere else. So, I mean, there's really no one right or wrong answer. You're getting really eight is. to one and you're turning it off, Nick. Just, I'm saying if I can get 10 to 1 and fill my board, lines. <laughs> I mean, this, I mean, that's, that's something that is I, very seen specific to the home services industry yeah. is that you have limited inventory. I worked previously at an e-commerce company that had warehouses full of stuff that you could sell all day. Like there was more stuff to sell than we possibly could imagine. In the HVAC world, we get to places. I had a phone call with one of my member companies that I called them for plumbing services and they said, we're, we can barely even help you. It's gonna be three weeks out before we can even do anything. At that point, yeah, an eight to one return is great, but on what? You have no inventory left to sell. Right. So, so you definitely need to consider that. Let's talk about that right there. We're in the craziest times we've ever seen, right? Like yeah. the, you know, supply chains are backed up. You guys are hearing about that. Inventory is hard to get right now. Um, do you think the manufacturers are doing this so people are buying in big quantity? Because people are buying in big quantity from the manufacturers more than ever right now. They're buying big. Do you think they're doing this on purpose or do you think there's truly just a dried up demand on all this inventory and people are backed up and it's hard to find labor too? Can we talk about those two things? That's big in the industry right now. Yeah, those are big. Um, I would say that from the equipment side of things, I don't think it's, they're doing it intentionally. I think that, you know, if we take into what happened, you know, last year and coming out of 2020, which was just, you know, nuts and just what's going on with just, you know, the, you know, the supply chain in itself and, you know, where the, where the hangups are, I think that's what's going on. I would I would guess that you're, we're going to start th to see things normalize maybe next year. I'd be very surprised if we're in the same, you know, in the same uh, situation from an equipment side than we are now. However, what I'm seeing is though our member companies and they're getting creative. I mean, you know, they're making those swaps for different manufacturers and um, they're still able to, you know, go in and service the customer, which is awesome. Um, so they're doing a really, really good job managing that, in my opinion. Now, yes, you have issues with parts and stuff, but again, they're doing a really good job being resourceful um, and working and partnering with those manufacturers with their vendors, you know, for alternatives. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll talk again next year and see if we're in the same position. Um, and then I can either eat my words or not. <laughs> I'm curious myself too. Nick, what do you yeah. think? I mean, I don't think it's a situation where they're artificially trying to inflate demand. I think that there's enough I mean, I'm no expert and this is really getting like past where my <laughs> level of knowledge is, but I would have to think that there's supply chain issues. There's issues with workers on shipping stuff back and forth. I think that if you see this across so many industries uh, and we're seeing this not only for equipment like HVAC pieces, but we're seeing like cars, like cars, Furniture. they're not able to sell cars because the chips, they can't manufacture the chips and they can't get those things going. Mm -hmm. So I think that because we're seeing it across so many different industries, it definitely is not an artificial restriction on the supply to try to increase the um, the cost of it. Uh, but it definitely will be interesting, like Alicia said, what, what goes on and, and how things change as these things start to open back up and people have more access to it. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned, the, the um, recruitment labor. and labor mm -hmm. shortage is huge. And it's I don't think, I think like if we hear a member that says, oh, I have too many people on staff, that is like, the rarest of rare things I've ever heard is I just have too many people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that definitely is a good way for me to throw over to, we have Explore the Trades, that's Nexstar's sister corporation that helps try to get people in here. And I think that that's more and more 
what we need to focus on is how to get more people into the trades as an industry, because it's an amazing opportunity. At, like a lot of people that I've talked to that work for next our companies love the, the, the company they work for. They didn't have to go to the traditional schooling. They were able to do it. And yeah, there's a, definitely a specific skill set uh, that goes with it, but we're really lucky to have the explore the trades program there to kind of help uh, get more people into this yeah. industry because we desperately well, need it. Yeah. And I think with, you know, with Nexstar, so going on, going back to that recruiting and the labor. So, you know, with, you know, we have to explore the trades. We, you know, Nexstar has been awesome to create kind of a funnel um, for, you know, getting, you know, recruiting labor and then getting them into, you know, into the industry, if you will. And, you know, it starts with explore the trades as Nick said, which is a nonprofit. Um, but then, you know, once you get them hired, what's a, a member, you know, company will get them hired. They, uh, we have Next Tech Academy. And what that's been, that's done is it provides all of that, uh, you know, training that, you know, in the classroom training, um, right to the members, and they're able to do hands on training um, with those recruits and those new employees to get them ready, you know, and then they graduate the next tech academy and then you know, they, they're ready to go as apprentices, you know, they can do apprenticeships and then they can, you know, get hired and they can basically cultivate their own, you know, their own, um, you know, their own field. If you, you know, field techs, plumbers, electricians, which is awesome, you know, however, you know, that's that, you know, right. But that takes a long time, you know, it, it, there's time there. And so, we got to keep, you know, filling the funnel there. Now, a lot, I mean, we're in the summer right now. So peak season, everyone, you know, there's just, we're seeing that, right? Their boards are full because of labor, because of this, that. And, um, you know, I think a lot of, um, at least a lot of my calls lately have been turning off, you know, a lot of their digital marketing and their channels because they can't take the leads anymore. And now they're shifting to recruiting. It's like, all right, I have this much money. I got to, how can we, you know, how can I recruit? And so that has definitely kept, we have talent coaches, we have two talent coaches as well um, that help with recruiting and retention um, here at Nextstar too. And so that has kept them really busy. And it's, it's all, it's forcing all of us as coaches in terms of marketing and the talent coaches to get creative. How can we get these, you know, how can we get those eyeballs? Because anyone who isn't working right now in the trades you know, there's something, you know, there's something, there's something up. Why aren't they, you know, why don't they have a job? Are you, are you finding companies are using Facebook and Instagram to recruit people more and more than ever right now? Because it seems like, <laughs> you know, that's the funnel of a lot of people bringing people in at a very low cost per acquisition for employees and, and applications. I mean, some of the clients right now, we have a run at like $4 an application. I mean, are you seeing that yourselves with other cus customers? Absolutely. And we're actively, you know, that is one of the strategies that we're actively, you know, reminding members to utilize because not only in general, is there just more activity on uh, Facebook and Instagram specifically, um, but to your point, it is a super, super cheap um, you know, cost per click and just cost per acquisition, if you will. And the other thing is, um, you know, that's where these recruits are and these prospects are hanging out. They're hanging out on social media, you know, and so it's like just it's another place to be in front of them. And, you know, Facebook specifically has so many, you know, free ways to get your jobs out there, you know, through the jobs posting and through, you know, marketplace through, you know, I mean, so it's, it's just another place to utilize that and, you know, showcase your message and, you know, use it to showcase your culture and, you know, your brand and what it stands for, because they're also, you know, if they're interested in working for you, they're going to go to your social media pages and validate that you're, you know, you're kind of walking that walk. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to bring up, Alicia, is that like social media is really becoming more and more important in this like new era that we're in. Uh, people want to do business with a company that they feel comfortable with. They want to work for a company that has good culture. They want to work with companies that have good culture. So using social media is a great way for you to push that. And we're seeing that uh, a lot of times with a lot of our members of pushing, hey, we're a, a, an employer of choice. Here's our company culture. And not only will that get you more employees who want to be a part of that culture, but it gets you more customers because they see that they're dealing with a company whose employees are happy to work there instead of a company whose employees are miserable and they show up and then they do bad work because they don't want to work there. So yeah, definitely this, this new era of seeing inside of companies has made it more and more important. Let's talk about that. You know, you work with a lot of different agencies, right? I asked you what, kind, what, what HVAC plumbing companies do good and bad. It's not to put people on the spot. Tell me what you, from your experience has been seeing what good agencies do 
and some of the things that bad agencies do. And I, you see, and don't name any names. Just give us some of the things that you just see that are good and bad. <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing Nick and I probably are agreement on this is you know the the level of reporting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we look at that first because to your point, as you said, Lance, it's, it's, you know, if you have bad data, it's like garbage in, garbage out, and how can you make a decision off of it? So, you know, it is, um, it, it really is how much, um, you know, how much data is provided and what does that reporting look like? Can we look at the metrics year over year to look at comparisons? Can we, you know, are they showing, you know, what matters, um, you know, to have that conversation? Um, and, you know, so their clients can make decisions. So I'd say for me, um, it's definitely about the reporting um, and the transparency of it as well. Yeah, I think for me to, to build on that, the reporting is very important. And similar to what we were talking about earlier is communication. Mm. It's about being in communicative with them and not necessarily just like, hey, here's data, but what does it mean? And what like making sure that they understand what it means for their business a lot of these businesses are looking for agencies to just they're they're doing it to set it and forget it i, I hired an agency i don't need to do anything they're doing it all for me but it really is yeah exactly it, it's a two-way street and they there needs to be that communication back and forth to know what's going on and for them to feel confident in the decisions that are being made uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be involved in every decision that's being made, but they need to understand why it's being made and um, feel good about like the decision that they know they can come with confidence that th this agency is working on their behalf and is doing the right work. Mm -hmm. Alicia, you used the keyword we're going to talk about two things. You said transparency, Alicia. Nick, you said communication. So we're going to talk about these two things, right? Does it surprise you how many agencies are not transparent and will not give the data that clients should be getting. Does that surprise it still happens in today's day and age? <laughs> surprise is an interesting word uh, to use. I wouldn't necessarily use the word surprise. I think that what it comes down to is like there is maybe still a misunderstanding about what, an, what people want when they are getting this data. Like there's so many different ways that people are doing it. Some people are dumping data onto people. Some people are trying to curate it into this very specific um, way of going about it. And mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the hardest things that I'm seeing. Like, I mean, the work that agencies do a lot of times is very similar, but that's the biggest difference I see a lot of times between agencies, is like how they are doing that communication out and what they're showcasing and what they're bringing up. So I think that that's, again, it's not really surprising. I think it's just really interesting for us to see all the different ways that people are trying to get this information across in the best possible way. Everyone kind of has their own idea on this is what good reporting looks like. Yeah. Um, and it, crazy enough, every agency has a different, uh, different thing that they think is the best way yeah. to get reporting. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, some people won't even give their clients access to Google analytics. That's very true. But yeah. some, I, mean, I know some I, members who don't want to look in Google analytics there's too much data in there. Like they, they don't have time to dig into it and they don't know. So yeah, like I can see from an agency side why you would think that would be the right move of like, no, there's no reason I should give them access to a hundred different things when I know that they really need to look at three things. But on the other side, eventually you're going to get to that point where you're like, okay, well, are, is there something, why won't you show me this data? All of it is being curated mm -hmm. and what like that's that, my that only trust thing. issue does come up sometimes. And that's my only thing. It's you guys are both seeing line reporting, and people say to me, "Well, and there's line reporting, and then there's line can reporting, right?" The line, the line reporting is like you said, Nick. I hate to use the word dumb it down, but it's hey, this is simplified. It's Focus. easy. Yeah. It, here's a few key metrics. It's really what you need: leads, cost per lead, and where they came from. And you listen, right? So it's very simplified. But then you have the people that want to see everything, right? And they want that transparency. Uh, I, Heather Arlinghouse, if you tell her that, you know, she, she'll probably hit you with a baseball bat, right? I mean, she, <laughs> she, she wants it, right? Yeah. So that's full transparency because you have every single uh, Facebook insights, Instagram, you have, you have line review, you have every, like you, there's not an ounce of data that you can't find in there, right? So that's where, I think where if they were just being totally transparent, you take all the cards off the table. Cause we, you both know as coaches, there's always problems with digital marketing. 
there's greatness and there's always issues you got to fix up, right? It's a matter of what oh, yes. level of impact. And I think that's what agencies are afraid of sometimes and other people, someone's going to find something wrong, one thing, and they hang on to that to get you fired. And that's not fair either though. So I just right. want to pick up with those agencies. Do you guys feel that might be part of the reason why? I can understand that truthfully. Mm, I, I, in terms of the transparency, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. I think it all comes with context too. And that's what we try to help our members understand as digital coaches, because yeah, I mean, that is a tactic that a lot of, you know, if you're, you know, prospecting and, or trying to poach, yeah, I mean, they're going to go after the one thing. And so, you know, that one little misspelling <laughs> or the one little punctuation error um, on, you know, the, you know, one of the like ancillary service pages or whatever, but yeah. You know, regardless, though, I think that's our job as coaches is to, you know, help members understand the context. And to your point, you said it, the impact, you know, what impact does that really have? And the other thing is we also remind members, too, if they're being, um, um, you know, if they're being, uh, you know, pitched, uh, you know, by a new agency that they've never heard of or, you know, whatever, you know, we also remind them that, you know, that agency may, they can only see kind of from the outside, right? And it's, you know, they don't have any idea what the strategy is on the inside. Because, I mean, they may be focusing on, you know, something completely different, you know? So that's the other part too, is um, helping them understand, again, the the impact and, you know, making sure that that as members, and so they're working with, you know, their agencies and their partners, that they understand the strategy, um, you know, especially for our HVAC companies, because the strategy will change, right? It changes seasonally. Um, and so they need to understand that. And that's what those, those companies who are pitching, prospecting don't know. And they're going to just, you know, grab on to, you know, ranking keyword. I don't even know, you know, just the, again, those things that may not matter. It, you know, Nick, you said something about communication and I, and I truly believe you can never have too much communication. And then some people think you can have too much communication. <laughs> and then sometimes I think people communicate about things that don't even matter, right? You know, so someone came to Noise. Bill Rizal and said, listen, I gave you guys the example. My H6 tag wasn't there, <laughs> right? And I, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I said nice to the person. I said, that's great. Your H6 tag isn't there, but why would it be there? You only have four paragraphs. So your H5 is not there either. And they were like, huh? And so it was someone gave him a report, you know, like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But if you're not having this conversation, Nick, can you touch on communication and why it's so important to really, because people do get lost in the weeds here and just not even in the weeds. It just, it's like one big, like I, I tell people, you're like drinking from a fire hydrant if you truly try. Can you talk about that, Nick, about the communication? And then we're going to talk about what should they be looking at? What type of metrics from, in your opinions? Yeah, Nick. yeah, and I think you said it really well. It, it, communication comes down to context. And yeah, like you can over communicate. I have seen even in uh, with the membership again, because our members, a lot of times the people who are in charge of marketing are also in charge of the call center are also in charge of even operations managers sometimes are pulled over to do marketing and they're wearing a lot of different hats. And there's agencies or like different companies or different people who will send emails every couple of days. They're like, I can't do this. I can't listen to you every single day. Like you need to, I need you to be a little bit more autonomous. So like, yeah, there's definitely over communication. And again, that comes with context. What do these people need to know? What is my responsibility? What are my roles and goals in this relationship? Because I, I, I tell a lot of our members that having a digital agency, you treat them like you should treat an employee. They are working for you. Like you need to keep up on them and you need to be there with them. You need to have that communication uh, because just as you wouldn't send a technician out in the field and be like, oh, I don't care what you do. Just go out and do it. You're going to check on them. You need to know what they're doing and you're not going to ride along with them every day. Your best technician, you're not on ride alongs with every single day. You trust them to be out there doing the right work. You check in on them. You see what they need. You make sure that they have the tools that they need to succeed and that an agency is the same way, that you should be checking in with them. You should give them the tools they need to succeed for you. And you should be checking in with them, but you don't need to ride along with them necessarily every single day to get the best out of them. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to fire questions here to each one of you real fast. Give me your top three metrics you look at, Alicia. Uh, website traffic, year over year. Um, I look at cost per lead and conversion rate. 
And Nick? Uh, return on investment. It's the biggest one uh, that we look at. You got to be making money. Everything that we do in marketing is try to make money. Um, I think that looking at funnel metrics is really important and that's going to cover a lot. So like making sure that you're not losing people as you go through where, where are these gaps happening and why? Um, and I think that that's really important is looking at that customer journey. So I'll say funnel metrics, I'll look at customer journey. I want to see what are you saying to people? Who are you saying it to? Like that kind of stuff is really important because a lot of times we just spam out and we just say, Oh, I, I sent this message out. Well, cool. But who's listening to that? Who did you tell? And did they even want to hear that? Like you can't tell that piece to a new customer or to a current customer. You don't want to tell them that you're giving 50% off to new customers. You don't send that to your current customers. Like you, <laughs> you don't want them to feel bad. So it really is. Yeah. Looking at that, that that's really important to me. So, and you know, two more questions and I know we're busy. You guys got busy lives here. So I appreciate it. What do you think is the biggest opportunity right now for everyone in digital marketing in the trades fields, home services? Oh, that's <laughs> tough. That's good question. The biggest opportunity? Mm -hmm. mm. Gosh, I have two. So sorry, because Nick, you said rapid fire and he definitely was not rapid fire. On the <laughs> um, so I think the biggest opportunity that I see is Google My Business. Google My Business listing. I still think um, you can optimize it and there's still optimizing you can do and you can still be active. Um, and I mean, just also, you know, I don't see a lot of members fully optimizing that listing yet. And we see, I mean, especially the last couple of months, we've seen the increase of traffic, just activity from Google My Business listings, you know, whether they call, whether they hit the website. So I think that's a huge one. Um, the other one I'll say is more broad, but I still think we can continue, um, you know, with the help of, you know, their, you know, their vendors and agencies to help um, make the paid advertising more efficient. You know, how can we, how can they, you know, how can the paid advertising work with their call boards, work with the seasonality, um, you know, versus just like, all right, we're going to batch it, you know, through, you know, all these zip codes and it's just going to run all the time, you know, and it's like, there's just, I think we can tailor that a little bit more to make the spend go farther and to get a better ROI. Nice. Yeah. Next. I think for me, the biggest opportunity is planning like just flat out so many people are flying by the seat of their pants and I spend money because the call board, like I'm not, I feel like I'm not getting calls. So then I just throw money at it and because I, I didn't have a plan in place. And it's just like getting a plan in place is difficult, but the difference we see when Nextar has worked with members that have a plan and know what they need and know what they're going to do to achieve that makes such a big difference as compared to somebody who's just throwing money out the door as soon as the phone stops ringing, because that's never the way to get your best return on investment. You're, you're just shooting. You're again, it's just money out the window and hoping that people grab it and walk in. Like it's, it's so tough. The final roar, small business owner right now, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, doesn't matter. They're struggling with their business online. They're trying to figure it out how they get it going. Give them the first piece of advice. Each one of you go. Where did they start? What did they start with? Look inwards. The first thing you need to do is look at what you're doing and figure out what am I missing? What am I doing? Because that's, again, people, if you're not looking and you're not assessing inside, you're not seeing what opportunities can be missed. And a lot of times that requires somebody else to talk to. So a lot of times it is looking at an agency or it is looking at digital coaches, things like that to say, what am I missing here? What's not here? What, where are my blinders that I'm staying here? But yeah, really mm -hmm. the biggest thing that you can do is just assess what you're doing, figure out, okay, what does success look like to me and what channel can I use to make that happen? Yeah. And I think to Nick's point, I think it's, you know, making sure, and this is, you know, this is an analogy we say all the time, but making sure your house is clean before you invite people in. So meaning, um, you know, marketing is all about making the phone ring. And so if your operations uh, aren't, aren't established or they're, you know, your, your, your booking rate is really low, your tech conversion rate is really low, then, you know, again, it's going to be money out the window if you're going to spend it on marketing to get the phone ring. You're going to, it's just going to be waste. 
So, you know, I'd say definitely the, um, you know, make sure you have a clean house first. So are we too late to do rapid fire questions to you then, Lance? No, go have, have fun. I was, uh, here we go. All right. <laughs> well, one thing that I, I wanted to talk to you about um, is what digital marketing tactic do you think is most underutilized? What do you see people not utilizing that you're like, man, one SEO has this and nobody's using it. And that's really what they should be using. Well, I think there's two things. I think people don't audit their, and you equate it to it, Nick, but you didn't use the word audit, right? So I don't think people audit their stuff. So I don't think they walk through and truly audit what they're doing from a digital plan all the way through. And that means from every touch point, SEO, PPC, email marketing, remarketing, social media, a display, whatever it may be, every touch that you have, people don't audit, look at the metrics and see how they're assisting each other and is it working. So I think that's one. Number two, and I know you're not supposed to be weather uh, cognitive, but you know, what SEO has line logic, which is all around weather, and it forecasts out 15 days off of your own data, what the budget is, what you would need to fill your three-day job board consistently and changes as the weather off your five years of historical data. So I think people don't utilize that. And, you know, you said something right now in the middle of summer, everyone is jam-packed. So if you're jam-packed and you don't have it, like you said, Nick, we're not going to pause out your PPC. We're going to reduce it very drastically and save that money for maybe shoulder season, right? When it's a little different and you might pay more. I don't think people understand. I might pay 60, $70, eight hours right now per lead because everyone's so busy, right? Or a hundred, whatever. Well, during shoulder season, I'm still willing to pay 220, 250, 300 because I'm still getting a job someone else isn't getting. I'm keeping my techs busy. They're not going to leave. There's many reasons on why you're willing to spend more on a conversion doing them. I don't think people talk about that, Nick. So I know that's a little over people, and but they're yeah. conversations I think people need to have. Business conversations. Yeah, like, ad like adjustments, making adjustments. And again, not doing a set it and forget it. And uh, I, I know it, but yeah, actually legitimately looking through and changing based on the changing seasonality. Absolutely. So yeah, that'd be the answer. What else? What other question you got? What do you think happened in 2020 that's going to stick around the change now that we're all trying to get back to normal? What do you think is actually going to stick around now that we're past that? I think people will do less in person. I think people will, I don't think people are going to travel as much as they once did. Um, I think people will be home more with their families. You get into routines, right? So people have been home. Even me, I was a big traveler. Now I'm constantly with my children, my kids. And um, I think that's going to stick, which is going to impact the amount of home improvements people constantly do. I mean, this has been record years for a lot of companies of home improvements. I don't think that's going anywhere, Nick. I really don't believe that's going anywhere. And I think the biggest thing that's going to stick around is I think people understand now they have to be it, People say, oh, I'm old school. I'm not a technology guy. I'm not a technology girl. I'm well, that's changing where everyone's understanding. I got to be on a Zoom. I got to have a conversation. That's not going anywhere. Yeah, no, I would tend to agree. I mean, this home office did not exist a year ago. And now I needed all sorts of stuff to make that happen. And we're, like you said, we're spending time at home. So yeah, I, I agree. I think that that's going to be a big thing going forward. What other questions you got? What's your walk-up music? What's your, what's, what music gets you pumped up? That's what I want to know. Honestly? Yeah. Country music. Country music. <laughs> nice. I would not expect that I out of my Jersey guy. Thank you for a country boy. That's funny. <laughs> I love country music and people always laugh at me. I'm like, that's what I listen to. That's fun. I love that you listen to country music. It was just very unexpected coming from Jersey Lance over here. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome last final rapid question and i'll let you guys go go ahead nick uh what's one piece of advice that uh stuck with you like what's the one piece of advice that you kind of always have in that back of your mind don't care what other people think about you okay i right. honestly live by that don't worry about what anyone thinks if you're true to yourself and you know who you are just keep going forward the mission you'll be successful all right i'm gonna push okay. it to alicia too what's yours my piece of advice yeah Oh, um, <laughs> Nick, we didn't discuss this. <laughs> You're on the hot seat. Let's go. Um, I'd say uh, it, it, um, gosh, that's a good one. I would say it's, yeah, be, you know, be true to yourself um, and confident in your decisions. And Nick? 
one thing that's always stuck with me and it's not necessarily business wise, but just in life is you got to be laser focused on your own happiness. You always got to be, you got to be looking out for number one. You got to be there and, and doing what you think is best for yourself. Um, and, and making sure that like, like Alicia said, your home is clean, then you invite people in. So mm -hmm. you, you always got to be laser focused on yourself because that's going to be your best self for everybody else to work with. Well, thank you both for being on the den. I appreciate it very much. I did. Yeah, thank absolutely. You, thank, you. thank you. See you guys. All right,